You are listening to The Interactome, a podcast by a group of young researchers who want to connect you to the world of science by sharing their stories and perspectives. Just in case their bosses are listening, they want to remind you that the opinions expressed here are their own. They also want to remind you not to take anything they say as medical or professional advice, as they are not doctors. Not yet, anyway. Stay tuned about that. And, without further ado, welcome to the Interactome. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Interactome. I'm one third of your hosts for this week. Um, It's Natalie, and we're so excited to also intro a guest that we have um, within a new science discipline that we really haven't explored before. Um, So we're really excited to get that started. But before we intro our guests, I'm just going to kick it over to my co-hosts to to say hello to the people. Hello, uh, I'm Sam. I am a uh, development engineer in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. Um, So that's kind of my thing. Uh, Yeah, I mean, you probably know who I am at this point if you've listened to a bunch of these episodes. I mean, I guess you should have known who Natalie is too, so. (laughs) Nice to meet you all. (laughs) Yeah, nice to meet you if you are uh, new to this one, though. Uh, Happy to have you here. Hey guys, my name is Maya. I'm a PhD student studying molecular and cell biology. Um, You may know me. I have recently come out of hibernation almost to um, come help interview um, a guest today. So I'm really excited um, to hear more about what our awesome guest does. So I'm so excited today to introduce our guest, uh, PhD candidate Christina Allingham. She is a food science PhD student at UMass Amherst. We both went to college together because we were both microbiology students. Um, She had a focus in microbiology and food science, and I did microbiology and journalism. So it was fun when we were in undergrad, we kind of had that kinship almost of like we weren't doing that traditional microbiology track. And um, today it's going to be super exciting. We're going to hear more about how microbiology plays into her food science PhD, some of the work that she's doing. Um, But I think... uh, I, you know, I've talked enough, and I'll hand it over to Christina to give a little bit of background about herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina. Thank you, Natalie, for the introduction. I am a PhD candidate at UMass Amherst. I started off my undergraduate degree also at UMass Amherst in microbiology, and I had a double major in food science. So I originally started in microbiology. I absolutely loved infectious disease. I thought it was so cool. That's where I really saw myself going in my career. And then I found food science and my career goals completely shifted from there. I learned about food science from a student that I was in band with. He was in in food science and I was like, I have to do this. This is so cool. So I went over to the food science department. I added the major and the rest is kind of history from there. I've been there ever since. I think this is like my seventh year at UMass. So I'm an old pro at all things UMass. (laughs) Quick shout out uh, to Christina also being in the band. If you've (laughs) never seen the UMass band perform, get your little keyboard fingers to YouTube right now and type it in because it's extremely impressive. That's just a little shameless plug. Yep. Yeah. I was in the drum line. So. Wow. (laughs) Extra fun. Oh, wow. (laughs) That sounds awesome. I think my brother went to UMass and um, I've seen like the band all like decked out in their outfits and everything. It's so cool. Yeah, there's like 500 members. Like, we could barely fit on the field, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, my brother went to UMass, but it was like kind of more recently, so it was like COVID and stuff, so I never really got to see the big yeah. band or anything. Yeah, you'll definitely have so, to go. Yeah, I'll definitely have to visit. Yeah. It's, it's not too far away. No. So, Christina, I find it super interesting that you heard about this major, and then you were like, okay, I'm just going to add it. Like, you know, you didn't, did you take any intro classes, or did you really, were you just like, nope, this is perfect? No, so I actually, after my first year of my undergrad, I ended up volunteering at a hospital, and I worked in the uh, maternity ward, and I worked in the blood collection, like, lobotomy unit. Uh, as a volunteer, and I absolutely hated it. (laughs) I did not want to do anything in that field once I had that experience. I just didn't like it. It was not for me. So I knew that that route, that like pharmaceutical or like um, health-related background was not kind of where I wanted to go. 
So I pivoted after that and I added food science. Um, so I started my first class in food science my first semester of my sophomore year. Um, so I had already had a full year of microbio classes under my belt up to that point. Um, when I added food science, I took like an introductory, it's usually for freshmen um, class. We went on a ton of field trips. We went to like an apple orchard and we went to a fish farm and we went to like a bread factory. And it was just so cool to see that like application of all the things that I had learned uh, just come to life and just have that um, just way about it. And I just absolutely loved it. I fell in love with it immediately. So yeah, it was it was kind of a process to get there. But once I got there, I was like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> Those places will let you take tours? Yeah, yeah. So I guess when you're with the university. <laughs> ah, okay. Like, this way, I, I, I have... Sam's knocking on the door to every apple orchard. Please show me. <laughs> well, I've been, been, to, been to apple farms like, like picking stuff. But yeah. I was thinking like uh, I have worked several different places that are near the Tootsie Roll factory. And that place apparently is like Fort Knox. Like yeah. you can't go in. <laughs> that, like like it's like there's no windows. There's yeah. nothing. It's just it's just this like mysterious building that smells like Tootsie Rolls and gets tanker trucks. Yeah, full of, uh, that's how it is with like a lot corn of places. Syrup and that's, yeah. yeah, I interned at a few places that were like that. They just are like gray stone buildings on the outside, and you're like, oh, what is this? And you go inside, and it smells lovely. You're like, okay, I'm here. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I interned at a few different places. I, I've i toured a bunch of places with school and through my clubs and everything like that. Um, usually they visits like that involve, like you have to be totally on board with all of the good manufacturing practices that are on the floor for that production environment. You have to be like, basically you're treated like one of the employees. You have to follow all the rules. Um, so it is kind of closed off in that regard. Like you have to kind of know that, that industry to have a yeah. background in that. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I just love seeing like workers that loved what they did and um, just, yeah, hearing about different company stories. And I was just, I was so in love with it. So it was just, it's interesting we have GMP because that's stuff that I have to deal with. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's like my same sort of, well, you know, I'm do, using it in a different context, but yeah, that that's a, yeah. I was like, ah, there we go. Yeah. Uh, I, I <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm really. I also made a recent career change, kind of into that space. I'm kind of like, oh, those those are GMP, and I guess we also have like good laboratory practices. So yes. GMP is good manufacturing practices. GLP is good laboratory practices, and that sounds like oh, good practice. That sounds like it's like this is like like there's a dense book. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh a yeah. Intimidating. Oh yeah, especially in a yeah. food environment too. When you're trying to keep everything clean, you're trying to make sure your employees don't come in sick, and like all these different things that just go hand in hand with your food being safe at the end of the day. So it, it's crazy. And I'll go into that more when I talk about my projects and everything. It's, yeah. Yeah, so maybe we can start off with what is food science? I feel like I've heard, like when I first heard of it, I was like, science of food? Like, isn't that kind of broad? Like, how does that, you know, how, what does that mean? And especially in a research uh, context. Right, so it is definitely broad. Um, when I first saw it on the UMass um, course curriculum guide, it, I was like, food science, huh? I was like, oh, probably it's a lot of cooking, right? Like, it's a lot, probably I have to be like a chef or something, right? And my mom was like, you better not be in this major because you can't cook. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> um, but I realized really quickly that it isn't cooking. <laughs> um, being like uh, savvy with the culinary side of food science is a big part of it, obviously, because we're making new product formulations. Um, we're mandating safety requirements for different products. So you want to know the ins and outs of the product, but you don't have to be a chef to be a food scientist. And I think that's one of the bigger misconceptions about food science is that it's just all cooking. Um, food science is so interdisciplinary. Like I came from microbiology and I was able to completely segue into food science. Food science is such an applied science. It's literally the definition is that it's the biological, chemical, physical, including microbiological makeup of food. So all of the sciences that you know and love, all your physics and chemistry and microbiology, they all come together when it comes to food science. So food is the medium for all the research. So I'll give you an example. Like in our department, we're doing studies on blueberries and like how anthocyanins in blueberries help to treat cancer and stuff like that. Um, another researcher in my, my group is working on plant-based yogurts and making those taste just as good, if not better than dairy-based yogurts, like things like that. So there's so many different, there's sensory science, there's biology, there's chemistry there. 
So when I was taking my introductory classes, I really had to have a well-rounded sense of all the different sciences in order to apply them into what food science generally was before I found my more like niche group within food safety um, and food extension, which I'll, I'll talk about more. But yeah, it, it is really discipline, interdisciplinary. It's one of the most interdisciplinary sciences I've seen out there. You kind of know what you don't, you kind of know what to expect for like physics or like, you know what to expect when you go into a class, it's like marine biology, but with food science, it can kind of be anywhere. Um, so you kind of have to have a baseline knowledge of all the different science groups. And that's really awesome. It sounds like you're kind of like wearing a bunch of different hats from different scientific disciplines. And I imagine yeah. even with like different kinds of food, you could imagine like, you know, like yogurt is really different from like blueberries and et cetera, et cetera. And I can picture that there's so many different kinds of science that can apply to each kind of like food. Yeah, absolutely. And what I do personally is totally all about food safety. Um, so that leads itself to my microbiology background, um, infectious disease, but basically in food. Um, so like your salmonella, your listeria, um, E. coli, all those things are what I primarily focus on in one of my projects. I have two d very different research backgrounds um, for my PhD, but um, the first one primarily focuses on just good sanitation practices or GSPs um, in a food processing environment, specifically for small food entrepreneurs. So when people are starting up a new food business, they're often, they often come from the business background, right? Like they, they're not food safety specialists. They don't, they don't have a degree in food science. They don't have any background in this. They just know the business side and they want to make their products success, successful. So what I do is I go in and I help them kind of develop their food safety programs from the ground up, whether that's providing them with resources, um, giving them training, helping them train their employees, uh, and then implementing those training um, practices within their processing environment. Um, so that's been my primary focus throughout my PhD. I started three years ago now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of something that's carried out through all, through all. It's just the small processor group that I work with. So it's a really interesting group. I have a quick um, follow-up question. So you, you said you've been working on this for the past three years. Maybe what are some of the biggest challenges or biggest changes that maybe you've seen since the pandemic? in food safety training and, and preparedness and that kind of stuff. Does anything come to mind? Oh, yeah. So I started my PhD. Well, I originally started as a master's student at UMass, and then I transferred into the PhD program. We got all this great funding, and I was like, all right, I'll stay. <laughs> um, so I started in... You'll never hear that in science again. <laughs> no one will ever say, we know, got all this funding. It was like I one of those pivotal it. moments. I was like, okay, I'm going for it. Um, but yeah, so I started in May, 2020. Um, as soon as I graduated from undergrad, I immediately started my work, um, doing my master's, which was, it was great for me to just stay in one spot because I could keep going even through the hardships of the pandemic. Um, so when I originally started all of our trainings and my first initial project was going to be in person, we were going to develop all the trainings in person. We're going to host in person. We're going to go to multiple universities, work with like UMaine, Penn State, all these different places. And then we couldn't do that. So we had to put everything online. <laughs> we had to make everything virtual. I had to learn how to use all these different softwares and evaluation tools and, and all that. So on my side, it was a lot. It was a lot to learn on the technology end um, and making these trainings engaging for this audience that primarily takes trainings in person. Like, what are they going to get out of it if it's just sitting on zoom all day, you know? Um, so that was, that was a big thing for us, but for the processors, I saw a lot of different things. Like they were having really high turnover of their employees. That's always a rampant problem in the food industry. Anyway, um, they were having a hard time accessing grants and getting money for new equipment, new supplies to even attend the training. Um, and then there was that whole um, conundrum of does your food give you COVID or is, like are hmm. those contact sur surfaces yeah. giving you COVID? That was a huge deal at one point. So a lot of the food manufacturers now had to put on this like environmental health and safety hat and they had to be they had to wear even more hats than they usually do. So it, it was really overwhelming for them to just manage their resources at that time um, and then giving a training that wasn't entirely mandatory to these processors while this is happening was, was hard. It was definitely hard to recruit people for this type of training. 
Um, it's essential for them to know these things, but again, accessing that audience during this time was really tough. That's, that's really interesting. It's also funny that, um, you were talking about like people not usually coming into things with that sort of background. Um, I do have one friend who's just like been toying with the idea of making a, uh, a bakery or something. Uh, and it's funny cause she was actually our guest on an infectious disease episode. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, interdisciplinary so, like, right the, there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just really, it was just really funny. So I was like thinking about like, you know, people talking about like to trying to figure out baking safety and stuff. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I probably I have no idea what it's like to come into that from that sort of perspective, because, you know, the only time I've ever seen someone try to do that, they were a virologist. So, <laughs> uh, but the, I guess the COVID thing is super fascinating to me too, because so there's all this stuff about like the spread of COVID, like you we were talking about like how at the beginning of the pandemic, they didn't know how that spread. So like, how do you navigate something like that? Especially because I think I, if I'm, maybe the guidance is not as so strict about, it. I mean, I'm not a infectious disease expert, but wasn't it more or less settled upon that like, uh, surfaces were not one of the big ways of spreading COVID. Yeah. So, like, was there like a huge ramp up of stuff and then a ramp down? Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of hype at one point, and then they proved that you're not going to get COVID through a contact surface like your food um, packaging. Um, so it primarily came down to employee health and wellness. Um, so we talked a little bit about GMPs, good manufacturing practices, and a lot of those include like proper hand washing and like putting your hair back in a hairnet and not wearing fake nails and stuff like that, that could harm people that eat the food. Um, along with that, as an amendment to that, during COVID or post COVID, a lot of processors now have an employee health and wellness policy. So if you feel any one of the symptoms of COVID or really any disease, it, it like ha put, a, put a great spotlight on like neurovirus symptoms and all these different things, um, like, any type of vomiting, anything like that, stay home. Like, just don't involve yourself in the processing environment at all. Um, and they have more, like, enforcement of those types of policies. Um, obviously, when you have a small staff, like the group that I work with, it's hard to not go into work. And that puts more of a burden yeah. on the business. So really enforcing these things and making it, like, a community awareness goal um, was something that we were trying to do as well during that peak time. I think like that's an interesting question too, because I think when it comes down to like COVID, like I, I've realized like lately I've, I've caught COVID a couple of times and lately it's, it's melted into my allergy symptoms. I can't like tell the difference. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you, how do you, like I've got, I, like I got it bad the first time. I got it very mildly the second time. And then I didn't catch it a third time, but I was exposed and I had allergies and I thought I had it again. And it's like, how do you navigate some situations like that with different people too? It just fascinates me. I mean, right. Uh, right. Even like as a visitor to these environments, like I had to like do the temperature check and everything like that. And they have visitor guidelines and policies now. If someone comes in to work with you, like you have to have like not come into contact with people that have had COVID, X, Y, Z. Um, sometimes even back then I had to like take tests and like make sure I didn't have it prior to going into the processing environment because that would implicate the whole staff and then no one's working. <laughs> um, so it, it did become just kind of rampant, like within the, the food processing environment, especially for small staffs. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a struggle that we saw. And so it seems like there was a lot of education that went into it, right? You had to teach people new practices. This is why you can't do X, Y, and Z, even if you've done this previously. Um, and science communication, you know, is going to play a big role in that, right? Because you're coming from a STEM background and at, here at the Interactome, we're very passionate <laughs> about science communication. So maybe what did you find the most rewarding and maybe the most challenging when you were working with people with business backgrounds? Right. So yeah, a lot of people think that they have the best product in the world and they have this great idea and they put it down on paper and they're like, yeah, this will make so much sense. And then you talk to someone who's a subject matter expert and you're like, yeah, you can't freeze that or you can't can that or you can't process that. And then their dreams are shattered and they're like, oh, but I have seen a lot of industry folks who have gone in and they, they think that they have, they have it all figured out. They have their food safety plan. They think that they're, they're all set. And then we come in and we're like, no, like you have to completely rewrite this or you have to reformulate your product or like, and they're already, they already have traction. They're already selling to consumers like farmers markets, things like that, where it isn't so highly regulated. 
and then it falls back on us like oh my god do we like ruin this person's dream you know um so I think the harsh reality of it and what I've seen most people respond to is just really going back to the why like like you mentioned like Mm. really bringing it back to if you don't do this your consumers are going to get sick there are millions of people that are affected by foodborne illness every single year so do you want to be just another one of the statistics on the CDC website or do you want to like put out fire or and keep putting out fires or do you want to prevent fires what do you want to do here and really sitting down with them and having that like heart to heart tough love conversation of like what's your end goal here Um, and most of the time they do pivot and they say like okay like food safety is something I do really want to invest in um, just for the safety of my consumers and the people that I know and love that buy this product and they want to have a good reputation that uh, often that comes back to like the business point of view they want to look great to the to the community the environment so um bringing it back to the why is something that we've really tried to hone in on especially for our smaller groups um and and just kind of giving them the larger food manufacturing environments as like an example like of sustainability of Mm -hmm. good employee practices all these different things um and then that kind of brings it back down of like okay i have a goal in mind now it's something i can achieve if i work on this so yeah I'm, I'm like super curious about some of those things that you mentioned as an aside, like you can't can something, you can't freeze something like <laughs> there's a, like, I think I'm coming from a perspective of both someone who in the kitchen, I think is relatively chaotic. Um, and also as someone who like, you know, I, I'm used to GMP stuff on like, on, in places where like, you know, this, a product might not have ever hit the market before. Right. So like, like when you have like a novel therapeutic, the FDA guidelines can be relatively variable. And of course, like this is, this is a big difference between like, you can't can something, you can't like, from my perspective, you know, I'm thinking about like, oh, you know, can I filter a thing a certain way? Or what, what, what's like, or like, I mean, not even that. It's like, you know, what chemicals can happen, you know, way before something gets into a person or whatever. And like, I'll have these sorts of discussions. And, um, but like, uh, it feels like food space is defined really differently because we all cook, right? We don't all manufacture pharmaceuticals or drugs or whatever. So we don't like, we aren't accustomed to, cooking in a space where things have like a lot of controls on them. So like, why can't, why can some things not be frozen or why can't some things not be canned? But I mean, well, I'm sitting here like, if you drop the temperature or something, it'll freeze. If you, you know, you boil something, slap it in a can. I mean, that's how a can works, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So. <laughs> as not yeah. a food scientist. And food science is honestly a hard mix between like the consumer safety side and then the production safety side. So I tend to fall in the production safety side where as soon as it leaves the production facility and goes to like the supermarket, it's kind of out of our, our, our realm, but there is a whole different like group that does that. What I, so going back to your question about just the different reasons for why you couldn't process it, process something a certain way. Um, for something like, like when you talk about foodborne pathogens, there's this one really, really bad one called Clostridium botulinum. Yep. Um, so Mm -hmm. you got, and it can grow in anaerobic environments. If your pH is below um, or above 4.6, it can grow. Um, if something isn't refrigerated, it can grow. So oftentimes what I've seen just from a processing environment is someone's not doing that end process according to what the growth restrictions okay. are for that pathogen. And then it becomes a huge concern. Um, and there's also products that have just kind of like, I think we've all heard about like the peanut corporation of America and they had that huge salmonella outbreak and it was really revolutionary for all of the peanut butter companies out there or just peanut companies in general because we didn't know that peanut butter could house salmonella but we can, we know now that it can be housed in a high fat environment so things like that that are constantly coming out and I constantly tell my processors to be looking at like recall sheets and be looking at outbreaks and things like that just to stay informed for any like certain biological concerns that could come about for their product because those things are constantly changing and we're always seeing um, instances of new like pathogen concerns for products Um, so it's not necessarily that something like can't be this can't be that it's it's really just focusing on like how do you make your product safe at the end of the day Um, whether that's proper canning or like using a retort machine properly or something like that and really educating Uh, yeah. <laughs> Retort. <laughs> uh, you use a what now? A what machine? <laughs> so like, you know, those know. packages of like, like if you're going camping or something and you have like a, a very like vacuum sealed 
package of okay. like a stew or something like, like that. Like astronaut food. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like that would be like a retort machine. It's like in a pouch. Yeah, okay. so it, that kind of, it removes all the air um, and the pH has to be at a certain level so that botulinum doesn't grow when it's not at refrigeration temperatures. So all the all the chemical levels have to even out okay. and all the, all the metrics have to even out in order for your product to be safe. It's a, it's a perfect storm, but a, a lot of the time processors just don't know that those things have to be in line, um, which is something that I've been helping to educate on. And I, I teach full, like they're three day courses that I teach, um, okay. for this, <laughs> for this material, biological hazards takes up like the whole first day. Um, so there's, there's, it's really involved. It's a lot of information for these processors to handle, um, which is why I'm trying to develop better resources for them that are more like bite-sized portions than just giving them a three-day course. Cause who can, who can tell yeah. that? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I guess like I was just trying to reconcile this fully in my head. So like, that's why yeah. there's sometimes like companies where like pickles typically would come in like, like they come in, you know, jars, but there's some of them that we do buy it, that are refrigerated. Mm-hmm. And those are probably things that, because of the way that they want to make it taste or the process that they're using, that's not going to be safe for botulinum at room temperature yeah. to be refrigerated. Yeah. So there's, okay. so there's, um, there's also this thing like with pH and water binding, uh, which is why a lot of shelf stable products are able to be shelf stable, uh, meaning they don't need refrigeration. It's called water activity. It's basically the amount of water that's available within your product. So if one is full water, like complete just water bottle water um and then 0.5 is like i don't know some type of dry cereal or something um that just means how much water is available for pathogens to grow okay so that is often another factor that has to be um worked with or tampered with in order for a product to be safe so we've talked about a lot now we've talked about ph water activity (laughs) salt (laughs) content uh refrigeration all these different things that could play a role so you can see how like the more complicated a food production facility gets, the more complicated these education programs have to be and training programs and all those different things. So it, it yeah. definitely keeps me on my toes. <laughs> yeah, they, no, thanks. Sure. Cause I, awesome. I, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I definitely am coming at it from like a, a weird perspective. Cause in my head, I'm like, Oh, cause I was thinking about like, I think if you remember like COVID vaccines, they were originally had to be stored at like very cold. And they had like what's called cold chain storage where you have to store it, you know, below like, 80 celsius so like just like we'll give you frostbite almost immediately temperatures to keep it from going bad or whatever and then over a while they they figured out how to make it so you can store it at higher temperatures or they tested it accordingly and i was just thinking oh it's like that like it's the reverse but with pickles or with food (laughs) you know like it's like oh you can't store that the way shelf stable anymore you have to store it the other way so i think that's kind of what i was thinking about when i asked the question with like the pharmaceutical industry and stuff like okay what I can do just changes what can be done later, but it's not like you can't, you know, make a pickle that can't be shelf stable. It's just, if you do that, you have to treat it accordingly. Just like, you know, in the industry I work in, it's like you can't do things one way, you do it another way. And that comes with its own set of caveats. Okay. That's like, I was just sitting here being like, oh my gosh, does this mean that I'm just better at, uh, like I, you could make better food at home, for example, like if you, you don't have to store it. And so they're always going to be at like this, this, I, I am I like tasty food and I was like oh no does this mean it, it's it's less likely to kill me but it doesn't taste as good right. <laughs> kind of yeah. my head it, went. and a lot of people that they're like I've done this this way for a hundred years like I make pick, pickles at my house this way and I've done it for a hundred years so it must be safe and it's like new technologies out now like we know the risks now you should probably do it this way to ensure it's gonna be safe every time and like trying to convince them your grandma in the 1920s yeah yeah i work with a lot of farmers and they're all very like i did it this way since i was like three and i'm like okay (laughs) well you're gonna have to do it this way now it's it's tough it's really hard to convince this audience but yeah no for sure because i i think what you're doing is so important because I I think like a lot, like from what I've heard about food science is that like, this is a really good way to make like very inclusive change across like all sorts of people, like the people producing the food and the people eating the food, because you know, everybody has to eat. So having these safety practices in mind, I think like is a really good way to just enact change all over the place. So that's amazing. And I'm 
Yeah, I'm I'm still hung up over the peanut butter comment that you made too. <laughs> because I was just thinking um today, um I had like peanut butter as like part of my breakfast and I was just like staring into the peanut butter jar and I was like, How long have I had this? Like it lasts forever. <laughs> I was like, How does it last so long? How is it shelf stable? Um, so maybe that ties back to like the water content and like the shelf stable foods that we were talking about before, but yeah. I'm kind of am a little like maybe like satisfied in a weird way that peanut butter is like not as indestructible as I think it is. Um, yeah. With, like, the <laughs> salmonella outbreaks. So I'm like, ah, oh, it does have a weakness. So. Yeah. Cause like when you That's think of crazy. salmonella, you're like chicken or eggs or something. Yeah. And so no one had it on their radar for peanut butter. And then all of a sudden there was this huge outbreak and everyone was like, Oh my God. And we got to like, we got to fix it. We got to put out the fire. Um, so yeah, yeah that is like shocking to me. Yeah. So shocking. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of instances where that has been the case, especially with like other things like um, listeria is a big one with like deli meats and stuff like that. Um, e. coli has been a big one recently with leafy greens. Um, so yeah, th- there's tons of new and emerging recalls and, and instances happening with foodborne illness. So it's, it's always good to keep an eye out on those things. And um, I saw this meme the other day. It was just like, if you can read, like you shouldn't read anything on your um, ingredient list that you can't pronounce or like, or you can't eat something if you can't pronounce the ingredients or something like that. And I'm just like, well, I'm a food science major, <laughs> so I definitely can pronounce everything. So a lot of those oh, yeah. things in the ingredient statements are just for like stabilizers or for um, just emulsifiers or ways for the product to just stay intact and not degrade um, during that shelf stable process as well. Um, so a lot of ingredients are just meant to be there, to, just to to exist in the in the food matrix, and kind of just keep it safe um, as you as you store it. So, yeah, <laughs> take that meme. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> but yeah, but I feel like this um, kind of leads into nicely. We've heard that you've had you have a second project that you're working on during your PhD. Um, that concerns um, safety at the level of like um, dealing with pathogens. So um, yeah. we're really excited to hear more about that. Yeah. So I initially started research during my undergrad and I started that in neurovirus research. Um, so coming from microbiology, I was like, I'm going to find a microbiologist in the food science department that I can work with. Like it just, it made sense for me. Um so I went to the newest faculty member in the department and I was like, are you looking for undergrads? And he's like, sure, why not? Um, and he had a focus in neurovirus, um, which is the number one leading cause of foodborne illness globally. Um, I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> I, it's very cool now that I know that. Um, but he was one of the only virologists kind of in the area that was studying neurovirus. Um, so I, I immediately kind of picked that up and I, I ran with it and I did a ton of research on what neurovirus was, what its implications were in the food industry. And yeah, I, t- I took off on my own research project. Um, so when what, I started um, my... I have a yeah. quick question. Sorry. Um, yeah. So what kinds of food does neurovirus contaminate or are there like certain categories or is it just kind of like any food so neurovirus is known as like the cruise ship virus <laughs> that's like the the name of it that's notoriously given because on cruise ships specifically you have a lot of like ready to eat foods or like catering restaurant style food uh, and that's often how it infects humans um it's just through improper practices whether you go to the bathroom don't wash your hands and then you touch oh. your product, uh, things like that. Um, so it can infect large amounts of people at once. It has a very low infectious dose. Um, it's super hard to get rid of once it's on something. Um, so it, it's a huge concern in large environments and a lot of susceptible environments, right, too, right? It's it's like hospitals, schools, um, things, things like that. So... Um, Neurovirus can really infect anyone. Uh, it's no one is immune to it, uh, but it can affect some people more than others um, in in terms of sever- in severity and hospitalizations and all that. So, yeah. It's so it's not really like the kind of food. It's more of the environment that the food is in. Yeah. So like food service environments, anything that's like ready to eat, like. Um, like gotcha. lettuce in a salad or like a sandwich or something like that that's prepared. It's not 
cooked or processed more. It's just given to the consumer as is, things like that. Um, oysters as well. That one is also a big one. That one's kind of unique because oysters, what they do is they pull in water um, like when they're in their environment um, before they get harvested. Uh, they're pulling in water. So if your water system is in, like contaminated with neurovirus, it can go in and, and that can be how it gets contaminated. And oysters are often eaten raw. Um, so that can be how we get infected from that source. So a lot of research has been done on oysters, leafy greens, um, and then just like food service environments um, on contact surfaces and in suspension and stuff like that. Um, so my primary focus for my research is I work um, on this thing called organic load. Um, so right now, um, on in any food environment, if you were to like slice deli meat on that, that piece of equipment, it leaves behind residue from the food. Um, so that would be your organic load. Um, and when that's not properly cleaned or sanitized and left behind on a surface, that can make the virus even more, even trickier to get rid of on that surface um, because it provides like that food source or that like life source for the virus to bind to. So what I'm doing right now in my studies is I'm taking different levels of organic load on surfaces and I'm seeing kind of how the virus um, survives on that surface when I treat it with a disinfectant over different contact times. Um, so what we've found actually is that with even with the recommended contact time on a lot of these different like sanitizers and disinfectants, it's not doing 100% like great job at getting rid of the neurovirus on the surface of like contact surfaces, stainless steel, those types of things. Um, so yeah, there, there's a ton of different levels to my project. I'm also doing like a concealed observation study where I'm like going into a restaurant environment and I'm checking out like what they do. Like, do they wash their hands? Do they put the right amount of disinfectant on their surface or sanitizer and what contact time that's at and what concentration. And then I'm bringing that back to the lab and I'm testing those things. So it's a really cool project and I'm really excited to be on it, but and it, it does have a, a practicality um, like within the food service environment. So I'm really excited to get those results out there once I'm done. Food scientist slash food spy. Oh, you know. I think is your official title. <laughs> FBI agent. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's interesting that you bring up like the, like the, the food spy thing. Yeah. Um, because uh, we were, we had a, People being like, oh yeah. So on this other episode, the other interview, we had a, a micro, <laughs> we have a lot uh, of them. Yeah, yeah. We've had a we had a marine biologist come on. She was talking about how like observers are not always well tolerated, right? So if you're yes. out on a, a fishing boat, um, and like she was, I I don't, yeah. I mean, there's, there's kind of go listen to that because she has a very interesting and I think important take on that and that fact that like you kind of do have to work with people too. Like you can't just like yes. show up on a boat and be like, yeah, I'm gonna see everything you're doing and then I'm going to write a bunch of laws and you, you know, you can't expect that to be followed. You can't, you know, just be like antagonistic. And so it's like, you're saying like, you could go watch people prepare food. Obviously it's not like you're on a fishing boat with 10 people. It's like you couldn't hide on a boat the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. hundred percent. And that's so, what but, we've like, seen just even, yeah. even our preliminary trainings that we've done. Like you, you can't be talking at them. You can't make them feel like they're in right. a classroom and you're testing them. Like we even called our like tests at the end, like, knowledge assessments or like check your knowledge or like something cutesy so they didn't feel like threatened by it and it's so important just the vernacular you use when you're educating an adult audience and that's something that I've really had to tune into as a young scientist being like sitting here in front of a room full of processors and being like do this and they're like you've never been in my processing environment like, you have no idea um so yeah it's interesting that you bring that up it's it's easy to influence a group to do exactly what you want them to do. If you're like, I'm from UMass Extension, I do XYZ, I have connections with XYZ at the FDA, and like, they're going to do exactly what's on their sheet of training to do. Like, they're going to do exactly that. So by going in concealed, or they don't, they don't know who I am, upper management will know who I am to put me kind of in that like role. Um, but the people on the floor won't know. Um, so that kind of gives me a, a chance to just like observe in the rawest form, <laughs> just go in and see mm -hmm. exactly what they're doing. Um, and just seeing if they're following instructions, if they're not, 
it's not a blow to them. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna completely knock them down for that. I'm not here to do that. I'm meant to educate. So I want them to be better. I want to grow their their knowledge base on this information. It's not meant to like I'm gonna shut you down type thing. It's it's yeah. meant to educate. So yeah, providing that type of camaraderie at the beginning. Um, or going undercover <laughs> is a great way to like get those raw reactions and emotions from the workers and see what they're actually doing. So say a restaurant um, or a food practice, they have really poor practices. What do you do then? How do you, how do you intervene? Maybe what's the next step there? So like I said, like we, we have like we should be calling them in to like inspectors and stuff like that. And like, we have that like liability there. Like at some point I probably don't as a student, but like my boss's boss definitely does. Um, Right now I am using all of this as a learning experience for not only them, but myself. Um, I want them to grow. Like they're, they're small processors for a reason. They're still starting off. Um, If it were to be like a large manufacturing plant that has like, hundreds of food safety people on their staff that's a different story Um, but for someone who's just selling to farmers markets and they're really trying and they're trying to implement their food safety practices and they're just writing their food safety plan now they're hoping to get an audit in the future things like that like we want to help them Um, I've done visits I've gone on site to a lot of these places I've seen how their production works and then I sit with them and I'm like okay let's start from scratch let's get these things done um And then you see them like as the time goes on, like we've done interviews with processors and they're like, I got like super into it. Like I got super passionate about it just as we carried on, I spent more time on it. Um, And that's something I've seen just across the board. Like no one's ever upset that they went through the process. It's just hitting go and like getting on it. That's that really is what a lot of people are scared of at first. Um, and it's really just one of our initiatives to make it known that extension programs and university programs, we're here to help. We're here as a resource. We're not here to turn you in. We're not here to, to make your life awful. <laughs> we just want to help you. We want to develop programs so that resources are accessible and appropriate for this audience. So that's what we serve to do for this work. So cool. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's so nice to hear that um eventually after you know working with you and working with your team they're eventually like wait no this is important and I play a role in this and this can improve my business um so that's just awesome to hear yeah and there's also something called food safety culture that I've been really into recently and it's actually part of like when a food company gets an audit um they go through questioning about like their food safety culture so essentially Um, it goes beyond management and ownership. So if someone on the floor notices that like something's broken, they have the initiative that like food safety culture is there in the processing environment where they say, okay, I'm going to go find somebody to fix this. Or I see that somebody's not washing their hands when they come out. And so I'm going to tell somebody about it, or I'm going to let them know that they need to be doing it correctly. Things like that, like taking ownership for food safety in the environment and that's something I really try to instill in all the people that I work with is that it, it goes beyond just upper management giving you a training sheet and you signing off on, on it that you did it. It's an everyday, like, learned practice that you have to implement every day that you're there and doing your work. So that's been something really fun and rewarding to see grow with the people that I've worked with. Yeah, that's so awesome because I feel like it's it's kind of like you're trying to make like a culture of everyone buying in right regardless of like yeah. where you are and like the kind of like processing facility like you're empowering everybody to feel like they are very important and have a say and you're all looking out for each other. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of other industries do this too, right? Like you have business meetings or you have board meetings or you your e-board meetings or whatever that looks like. Um everyone just has to have pride in their work. And with such a high turnover in the food industry, it's so easy to just go in and do your job and then go home. But really having that that culture is what leads to a safe product at the end of the day, because a lot of the operators are just out there like doing very monotonous work. Um, so yeah, it's it's been really important for me to kind of instill that. I was just, I was just going to say that like, um, you know, the buy-in stuff is like super important. I think like... Um, you talk about all these processes and things, but at the end of the day, there's still a person doing the job and that's 
you know, you can, <laughs> you could do really well or really poorly as an individual. Um, and a lot of that has to do with like kind of how, how the culture is uh, structured, right? You know, you could definitely, and you see this in every industry too. I think I think we've all probably seen it where you'll be one place, the culture is one way you go somewhere else and it's like just totally different. And that's, so that's like super great that you're kind of focusing on that angle of things too. That's, that's very cool. Yeah. And it's like, we're humans, right? Like everybody makes mistakes. Everybody like has, has those errors. Days. Like there's human error built into everything that we do. So relying on just like these pieces of paper that I get a training on once per year and like, you're good to go. Like it's, it's a constantly, a constant thing that you have to be passionate about in order to carry out like every day of your job. So yeah, it's really important. So you mentioned that food science, we've talked about this a lot on this episode, is a really interdisciplinary um, space to be studying. How did you decide that you wanted to be on the processing side of that? Right. So it really went back to internships that I did and just getting that real life experience. I worked um, at a factory where I did half product development and then I was in the lab for half of it. Um, so product development is really like chemistry based. It's it's really just like starting from the ground up. All the new products you see on the shelf has a product developer behind it that has done market research, then went into the lab, did a bench sample and then scaled it up and all those different things. So I did that for a while. I I liked it. That's It's kind of more like the more flashy side of food science. Um, like seeing your product on the shelf is really awesome. I got to see some products that I worked on as an intern on the shelf. I was like, whoa. Um, That's so but, cool. <laughs> but then I moved into food safety and having the microbiology background just really helped push me in that direction because I knew I could apply what I learned in microbio into lab work with food safety. So again, foodborne pathogens, um, neurovirus specifically for me, but I have a lot of other applications with like E. coli and listeria and those things. Um, so a lot of these concerns come up when you have your processors in the room, they're the ones processing your product. They have a small team. So I, I really did fall in love with this side of it when I started working with the specific audience that I did. Um, and getting to teach them one-on-one, go to their processing environment, seeing how passionate they were, like this is their life. Um, and I, I just love that. I love working with like such individualized like groups of, of processors. And I, I just, yeah, that, that's why I, I continue to, to advocate for this audience and um, stay within this realm. Um, I don't know exactly what I want to do yet when I get out. Like we'll see. It, it, it all depends on what's, what's available at the time, right? Um, can't right. plan more than like six months in advance nowadays. So <laughs> we'll see what's available <laughs> when I get out. But I really do want to continue teaching. I, I really do love it. Um, so it, the program that I'm part of is called UMass Extension. So anybody that adds value to their food, whether that's through processing uh, of any kind, where there's food safety steps involved, that's who I'd be working with. Um, and de- again, developing those resources for them so it's more accessible. So We'll see. Um, I might go into government to be on the regulation side. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that's that's why that's where I'm I'm trending on going. <laughs> Many a doors are open, and yeah. you know you're not just a lab food science girly. You do a lot more <laughs> than that. So um, Christina also has a uh, blogging food blogging digital brand called at. Bite of New England. I believe it's at Bite of New England across all platforms. Mainly Instagram is your main one. I don't know if you have a TikTok. Yes, I do. It's a lot smaller, but it's still there. So you do um, a lot of really cool work. You go to restaurants and you review their food. And as someone who has been out to dinner with Christina, it's hilarious (laughs) because she will literally take her ring light out because she has to get good photos of the food. And if you look at her Instagram, Mm. everything looks perfect. (laughs) So that was honestly just such an iconic moment. But how does your background in food science maybe influence your social media presence? Right. So it... I, by the New England started and maybe it doesn't you yeah, know if it yeah, doesn't it, it, that's fine it definitely too. has more so recently um I started peak COVID it was like December 2020 um and I was like you know what I want to support the local food establishments that I've been eating at and getting takeout from that are struggling to stay open because of COVID 
um, I, me and Rob were getting like a ton of takeout. Rob's my husband. Uh, we were getting a ton of takeout. I, mean, I was just like, you know what? Let, let's do this. Let's take pictures. I I had like a huge backlog of food pictures in my phone. And I was like, you know what? Put them to use. Um, so we started it up and it ended up growing. Um, it's at a decent size now. It's It continues to grow, which I'm amazed by. Um, I look at the pictures that I took at the beginning. I'm like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, yeah, it's become more refined now. Um, and now I've, I've actually been working with like, um, the food safety outreach, um, like for education to consumers, um, group of the FDA. Um, I do a post for them every month on my page, just advocating for food safety with food delivery. Um, so again, just like maintaining proper temperatures, making sure you refrigerate once you're done eating within an hour, uh, things like that. And I, I just do little food safety reminders every month. Um, I've also helped out a lot of small artisan, um, producers on my page when kind of connect them with food safety resources. I have in my bio that I'm a food science PhD candidate and people have messaged me directly and they're just like, Whoa, that's like, that's so cool. I thought you just like took pictures and I'm just like, no, like I I can help you with anything you need. And I've actually helped a few people in Western mass kind of, um, develop their food safety programs. Like, and they've taken some of my courses and, it's kind of full circle. Um, but I, like I met them through the Instagram page. So it, it, it is kind of connecting me to just a bunch of different awesome food lovers out there. And, um, it continues to just kind of intersect with why I love food so much. (laughs) So yeah, it's really awesome. Well, that's That's so cool. Make sure to give Christina a follow again. It's at bite of new England, new England, like the region in the Northeast. (laughs) I don't know if there's another New England, but <laughs> just in case. It's late. It's 9 p.m. I usually go to bed at 9 p.m. Same. <laughs> Dear Same. listeners, so brain's getting a little foggy. Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, I was like, yeah, should we specify United States? But I don't know. Maybe maybe someone, <laughs> maybe somehow we'll, we'll get a bunch of people from outside the U.S. But right now, I think our, our listenership is very united states based Um, it's so weird because some people from england will like drop me a follow sometimes and they're like you want to come into our sandwich shop and i'm like no new england (laughs) new england (laughs) i'm like you can fly me out like i'm telling you i know like like, i'll be there get the jet i'll be there (laughs) i i do like i've done photography for a long time but never anything that was particularly i don't think it like it's never intersected with anything but i i know like the i would post at like random hours at night i could be kind of a night owl and so i've got like a lot of like Mutual followers from like Australia. <laughs> so if I were you, I'd be, your algorithm's probably, like, like ah. <laughs> there's, there's probably like, there's probably like a New England and like you know New Zealand or something. <laughs> if I were in your situation, posting it like you know, especially in high school, it was like two in the morning. Uh, that would well, be... also follow the Interactome Instagram as well. Oh my gosh, what is the handle, Natalie? <laughs> <laughs> it's inter- interactome underscore media on Instagram and on Twitter it's at the interactome. And, uh, <laughs> I'm <course> checking <laughs> to make sure that I'm right. Yeah, uh, of course you you probably follow us somewhere where you can get podcasts otherwise I don't know how you're listening to this um, but if uh, you're listening to us on Spotify we do also have and like your podcast apps we also have a YouTube account um, and if you're on YouTube well guess what we're on all of the major podcast apps so uh you know i don't know if that's particularly useful um but you know that's also out there we also have a mastodon i think it's um i think it's at interactum at universodon.com but um i i add in that and i should definitely remember what the handle is but again it's 9 p.m uh so we'll be dropping that in the description if i'm completely wrong you can laugh at me um even more than you already have but all right thanks folks for listening and tune in next time and, uh, thank you so much for joining us christina Thank Thank you you for having me. I think we can stop recording. You press the red button or the black square? Stop. Black square. Black square.